Sharing the joy, shining the light. It's been beautiful to study and to practice the Course because it's, it's a self-study program. And then it's wonderful to start to tune into that intuitive voice that's in, in all of us that just wants our greatest good. It goes by many names in many cultures, so it doesn't, the names don't really matter. But just to be in the flow of, of following that, and, and for me it's been great because I see the world now as just, the world is just a mechanism that witnesses to what we want in our heart. And while we still have doubt and fear and guilt in our heart, then we still witness scenarios and, and evidence of, of that, of those egoic uh, feelings. Like some people have used the, like the acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. That's a good example of how this world seems to be until we change our mind about it, until we forgive it and we see the world anew, until we let the egoic lens that we've seen the world be washed away. And it does take time and it does take practice to do that. Uh, people have asked me, you know, is, is forgiveness a, a process or an instant? And I say, well, it's a process until it's an instant, but really it's an instant. It, it doesn't really take time to forgive, it's just that when the mind is heavily invested in linear time, then a process is the most gentle way of reinterpreting the world. It would be too shocking to go from a nightmare into a happy dream. In fact, uh, you know, a lot of times that's a great analogy of a, of a child who's kicking and, sc and screaming and is in the middle of a nightmare. And if you, if you go and start to like shake the child while the child is in the middle of perceiving a nightmare, the child is likely to interpret that shaking hand as perhaps a monster another monster in the, in the nightmare because they're in the middle of it. And it's very similar with A Course in Miracles. It's the Spirit's coming to us and it's saying, well, it's, you're having a very difficult dream. Uh, it's very challenging, it's very difficult, and, and in some respects it can get so difficult that it can seem nightmarish. When we think about aspects of the dream like terrorism and, and so forth, and war and so forth, it really nightmarish uh, images that are part of the dream. And, and yet, we need a gentle way of waking where we can practice and learn to release our attack thoughts and our judgments and grievances and therefore see the world in a completely new way. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about a happy dream. It's a dream of non-judgment. It's not a happy dream as the ego would define a happy dream. I mean, the ego can come up with many versions of its own happy dream. One of them is like called the American dream. And if you read Time magazine or you read newspapers and magazines now, they're, they're talking about, you know, the American dream is, is, uh, is at, at risk, you know, because of the economy, it's the global economy and so on and so forth. But this, this is a dream that, that is the dream of of bigger, better, faster, more, of, of even of self-improvement. That's all part of the ego's dream towards working towards its own outcomes. And it doesn't really tell the sleeping mind that, that, that its happy dream is still part of the dream of death. And that even when you have what the world would call a happy dream in this world, you still seem to go through a process of, of aging, of suffering, and of dying. And that's almost like an accepted aspect of the dreaming of the world. So this is saying, no, it's actually possible to learn to forgive. And as you heal your mind, you open up to eternity, to the oneness and the true love that you truly are. So uh, I know when I was growing up, I was always liking to watch, read billboards and signs and listen to all kinds of music and bumper stickers. I remember the bumper sticker one time I was sitting and looking ahead and it was, life's a bitch and then you die. And uh, I was like, hmm. It's like, well, that, does, that kind of summarizes a lot of people's view of the world, you know. No wonder we have atheism and, 
and agnostics and people that don't want to even acknowledge God with a bumper sticker like that, life's a bitch and then you die. One day though, after I was working with the Course for a while and was starting to have all these miraculous experiences, uh, I was behind the car and I saw the bumper sticker and it said, life's a joy and then you ascend. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, there it is on a bumper sticker, you know. <laughs> and if you just take a moment, you know, there's a, there's a lot in those two bumper stickers. Uh, one is a, is a very dark and very pessimistic and really looks at, at the challenge and then ultimately the outcome of being death in this world. And the other one is saying, life's a joy, in other words, really enjoy the miracles and the appreciation and the gratitude that you have, kind of like Oprah has always talked about the gratitude list and emphasize the gratitude and then eventually as you go into that more and more you will ascend you will ascend in consciousness up to this glorious heavenly state of mind that is your true reality. And so, for many of us, we've gone on the spiritual journey and there's many, many pathways. And so, A Course in Miracles, I think is something that, that just resonated with me in my heart from the very first time that I opened the book. I just, I, just, I mean, I, I was in Calif Southern California in 1986 at a humanistic psychology conference and uh, some of you remember Carl Rogers, uh, Virginia Satir, beautiful teachers. That was actually the last conference that Carl Rogers ever spoke at. And I was with a group of people, a huge group, and they just applauded. Standing ovation for the man. Tears. Just so beautiful. And Carl Rogers was basically part of the humanistic branch of psychology, that everybody's good inside and we just need to uncover the core of our goodness. Abraham Maslow and so on and so forth. And so that's where the Course came into my life. And when I first opened the book, it was like a giant wave, a giant tsunami of love just washed over me. Uh, it, it, was, it was an amazing experience when I first opened the book. And I, I had this strange kind of feeling that However my life had gone, it was about to go off in a whole new trajectory. Like, it would be, I would be changed forever, and that life as I knew it on planet Earth was going to change in a radical way. And that's what happened. I mean, I, I found myself guided to Los Angeles and at this place of, of a teacher called Tara Singh. Some of you might have heard of Tara Singh. I, I found myself right Right after the Course came into my life, I was guided up to uh, this little house on Burnside, uh, Foundation for Life Action. So I had this feeling like my whole life is going in a new direction. I have waves of love crashing over me experientially. I go into this house and there's all these happy people coming up to me, hugging me. And I felt a little bit like that TV show, This Is Your Life, you know, at the end when they bring back your third grade teacher and all these people that love you in your life, I was just like, I mean, I just opened the book and now, days later, I'm getting all these people that I've never met coming up and glowing eyes and hugging me. And I'm looking up on the walls and it's Mother Teresa, Ramana Maharshi, Course in Miracles sayings all over the house. And I'm just like going, whoa, I have just reached heaven or something. I don't know what's going on. And so I took the course and I flew back to Cincinnati, back here to the Midwest, and I just had the feeling when I was flying that my life would never be the same. Somehow that would just be completely changed just by this new direction. And also I had, I mean, I grew up in Christianity, so I had some grievances with Christianity, to tell you the truth. I mean, when I was flying across the country, I remember this particular line from the Bible in the, in the Gospels, and it was, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And something in me just was like, oh, there's just got to be so many pathways to God. And, you know, just that statement, I would cringe. And somehow, with my little course book and flying across the country, I started to realize that, that those words were not spoken by a man. <laughs> I was just like... Oh my God. And that it was my misperception 
of, of the whole situation that is where the disturbance was coming in, that, that it was just this, the universal spirit of love speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So I was flying across the country already just having purchased the book and a, a book by Ken Wapnick, Forgiveness in Jesus, and a book by Tara Singh, Nothing Real Can Be Threatened. I had three books. I'm like, huh, wow. Coming across the country and just going, oh, I'm sorry, Jesus. I, I just, I don't know. I just, sorry, I thought you were a man. <laughs> you know, it's just like, my bad. You know, uh, you know it, was, it was so clear to me that, that in that moment that any kind of upset or grievance I'd ever had was all coming from a misinterpretation and not from anybody or anything in the world. So I just landed with such gratitude. Uh, I was involved, I had a girlfriend and she was more of a fundamentalist Christian and so I was very excited about the course and everything. Learned some very good discernment lessons <laughs> right away. <laughs> she was like, oh, mm, that's a frightening book. And, uh, and eventually she would say to me, um, she gave me an, an ultimatum, either marry me or never speak to me again. <laughs> and I was like, ah. But I already, the Course was starting to activate my, the love in my heart and I had to just trust that wherever that was going to take me, I didn't know where, I was going to have to follow it. So, needless to say, yep, I didn't see her for another I didn't, haven't ever seen her since, actually, come to think of it, but she contacted me on Facebook. But uh, ten years later, she had always had this thing about allergies and extreme allergies and interactions with the, the world in that way. And kind of like that John Travolta movie, The, the Boy in the Bubble. Eventually, she had, had quarantined, had been quarantined and all this and that from this seeming sickness of of interacting with the world and so forth and allergies and whatever. She had left the quarantine, walked away out into the desert, I think, and to a phone booth and called me about 10 years later, uh, just telling of her nightmarish uh, experiences with this world and life and saying she thought she would commit suicide. And I don't know what the Holy Spirit said through me, but uh, it seems like about a, a week or two after that she called me and she's like, Jesus completely healed me. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Whatever happened there. She just was a call for love and the Holy Spirit poured through me. And uh, that was great. And her husband, who after she broke up with me, she found her husband on a Christian date site. And <laughs> they got married right away. He hung with her through all of that. And it was just a beautiful witness of how of healing. You know, the, the healing is always there, it's just when we're ready and available. So, it's, it's been quite the journey and, and I've, I've, had, I've witnessed symptom removal and a raising the dead experience like uh, with Lazarus and Jesus had and there are lots of things that, that don't really fit into the boxes of the world, you know, you don't put those things on your resume or <laughs> you don't get called back for a second interview like, what? <laughs> psycho here or whatever but actually there's at the beginning of a course in miracles there's actually 50 miracle principles and I believe it's number 23 it says you can heal the sick and raise the dead because you made sickness and death and can abolish them both and that's just one of the principles the 50 miracle principles at the beginning of a course in miracles that's quite dramatic, I would say. There's a number that are quite striking. And when you start to give your mind over to it, you start to go, wow, I really am here for healing. And I do have a calling. And maybe I didn't grow up thinking I'd be a miracle worker or a teacher of God. It could be the farthest thing from what you imagined. But the more you give yourself over to this gentle healing presence, the more you start to have these profound experiences, you start to say, Hey, I, I'm open. I'm open to be used any way that you want in a healing capacity. And I, myself, and many, many people that I've witnessed have, have gone through such transformational experiences. And I don't put any limits 
on it. I don't think, well, it's got to stop here or there. I feel like the Course is taking us to the atonement, to the correction, to be healed of, of all misperception and to wake up from this dream. I have a friend of mine, Lisa, who was part of a Course group for a while and I was on, traveling on the road one time and she called me on the cell phone and she said, David? I said, yeah. She said, my Course in Miracles group is telling me that I have to tone down my joy. Is that the ego speaking or the Holy Spirit? I said, listen, the Holy Spirit is never telling you to tone down your joy. I said, if it gets too bad, you're going to have to let that group go. <laughs> I tell you, you can't, you can't hold on to witnesses. You know, this is about joy. This is about true happiness. You've got to face everything that's coming up because it's your own consciousness, your own thoughts and beliefs. But, but anytime you're drawing forth witnesses of limit, you have to just see that these are egoic witnesses that are trying to hold you back. And like Francis said, you had some of those, but then all of a sudden it just burst open. And now you're just getting floods and floods of witnesses for healing. And that's why it is called A Course in Miracles. It is really through miracles that, you know, Holy Spirit wants to convince our mind that we don't need to hang on, because our mind is so powerful. We, we, we have all these pains and all this experience because our, we want to, because we are addicted to that. And there is like a deeper, deeper reason beneath it. You know, we hang on, eventually we hang on to these experiences and the, the world because we want to hang on to this self-identity. That's the identity issue, but Spirit really wants to convince us through experience that there is something else you actually really want. And he, it's like just by practicing the workbook lessons is to really relax in the mind and let go gradually of the things and the thoughts and you know the interpretations that we have on this world eventually to to have the actual experience that we are more than what we thought we were and that's like um, yeah just a lot of miracles because you always said that spirit has a massive convincing job to do and I I, I like that I like that he needs to convince me and if I give over my life I give over my mind to have the willingness to do these workbook lessons and to do what he asked me to do, then I can expect miracles. I'm entitled to miracles. I want to be convinced. I want to be wrong because I feel pain. Then, you know, and he, it's his job to convince me. And I would say that the spiritual journey, there's, you know, with seven billion people on the planet, it's highly individualized. So. You know, it's not about trying to convince anybody to believe anything or convert anybody. I mean, these are old ideas. Even ideas of with gurus and ashrams and devotees and some that have got it and some that don't have it. It's, you know, it's these kind of ideas are, are older ideas now. We're ready for a new awakening experience that transcends all of that. So for me, it was important to, to realize that I was just using A Course in Miracles and following the guidance, and that the only purpose A Course in Miracles had was to put me in touch with my internal teacher, or our internal teacher. Call it whatever name that you want to. It doesn't matter what language or what tradition. We all have love, a very loving, internal, intuitive teacher. And it's not an analytical teacher, and it's not a synthetic teacher, and it's not a teacher that's going to <coughs> judge us and evaluate us in any way. It's very, very gentle and loving. So I worked with the Course in Miracles for years very deeply. I, I basically carried around with me so much with my hands and then finally I ended up getting a book bag for it to because I was on the move with it. And I, I it's a blue book with, with gold letters on it and I just I wore the, the gold letters off. I mean it was just this crinkly <laughs> blue book. It looked more like the back of the book instead of the front of the book because it just it had no more gold letters because uh, I used it so much. And then it came to a point when I started, I mean, first I was hearing Jesus and the Holy Spirit speaking to me, and then I was very shy. I was most voted most quiet in my senior class in high school. You know, and they had a, a man and a, or a boy and a girl, and each of us had microphones kind of poking fun that we were quiet, just 
with microphones and they took the class picture. And uh, so it wasn't so much only just hearing and tuning into that inspirational inner teacher, that voice, but then the voice said, now I'm going to speak through you. I was like, oh, whoa, oh, whoa. I mean, I, I, am, I have did not participate in any extracurricular activities, you know. <laughs> You're looking at most quiet here. It's like, well, yeah, we know that. Moses stuttered. We still had him deliver the Ten Commandments, and you just perceive yourself as shy, like a wall, wallflower, but that's not going to be any problem here. Just be willing to be used, and we'll take care of everything. So I did, and, and that was a bit uncomfortable, certainly for the ego, of even going to Course in Miracles groups, because I had this deep experience in my heart and this wisdom that wanted to pour through me, and yet, okay, it's a self-study book, you go to course groups. I happened to go to this course group in Cincinnati that was a big course group. It was kind of a long-running course group, and we'd get, I don't, know, I don't know, 25 people in there and so forth. And I started attending it regularly, and people would be struggling with the course, and what do you think he means there, and what's that mean, and what's this about? And I would show up and I would just pray, go into the group, and be willing to be used. And oftentimes when questions would come up, I would just let the Holy Spirit pour through with a very clear, succinct answer. And so this started happening and happening. There was no facilitator in the group. Like, you, have, you are the facilitator, I think, but in this group there was no facilitator. So it looked almost like a comedy skit. Uh, we would gather together, 25 of us, on any given night, Tuesday night or whatever, and then questions would come, and then all the heads would turn to the body of David after the question. Very unusual for a course group, actually. And this wisdom would come out, and then the next, we'd go on reading, paragraph at a time, question would come out, the bodies would all turn, the heads would all turn. So I thought, okay. And then, after these great miraculous experiences in different groups, uh, the ego still was wanting to turn back and judge. Why did you say that? You know, it always is trying to take something that's really impersonal and just gloriously for the whole universe and turn it into something personal. That's the temptation you have to deal with when you start to let the spirit speak through you. You know, the ego wants to claim credit or hammer you. <laughs> Why did you say that? And look what happened to them. And you caused it. And, you know, all this craziness. The Spirit's like, no, no, you didn't. You aren't doing anything good or bad. You're just witnessing this. Let let me speak through you and let me, you know, bring the witnesses to you. So that was many years ago, and then eventually it it got to the point where um, I was invited to some big um, Course in Miracles conference, and and I was asked if I could speak at it and asked to send a resume in and a photo, and the people around me said, resume? You don't have a resume. You don't even have a photo <laughs> to send to. You, you are gone from this world. I said, I think I can get a snapshot of somebody snapped a <laughs> snapshot of me going into a, a car with a, with a friend of mine and, and throw something together. I sent it in, it got lost in the mail. It was the spirit was saying, I told you, no career. I said, no career means no career. No means no. And it was like, just enjoy the spontaneity, spontaneity and the love and the joy that's coming through you because it's for you as for the whole universe, but don't try to use this in, you aren't ready for that. I guess it was more at that stage too, it's like the ego would be too tempted to turn this into another linear construct, another linear identity, and you're not ready for that yet, so don't don't go there. And so those are the kind of things that would happen to me as well as working with people and we had miraculous healings and, and really beautiful things that were flowing. We're very natural. We're told that healing is natural. Miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. <laughs> Isn't that lovely <laughs> to start to think that miracles are a natural expression in, in our life? and we can accept it that way. We don't have to think of them as extraordinary. We can expect miracles every day. 
And when they do not occur, something has gone wrong. Go back to your internal teacher for, for healing. <laughs>